everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. PBS's Frontline has a traveling exhibit, Unresolved, that's now open here at the museums. The exhibit draws on more than two years of reporting, thousands of documents, and dozens of firsthand interviews to examine the federal government's efforts to investigate more than 150 civil rights era cold cases under the authority of the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act. The exhibit runs through October 24th and is included with regular museum admission. And then tune in next week for History's Lunch when we'll hear from Joshua Rothman, author of the new book, The Ledger and the Chain, How Domestic Slave Traders Shaped America, as he takes an in-depth look at the Forks of the Road site in Natchez. Today, we're delighted to welcome Jim Crockett, whose new book is Rulers of the SEC, Ole Miss and Mississippi State, 1959 to 1966. During that eight-year stretch, the two schools won 12 of the 24 conference titles for football, baseball, and basketball, ahead of such powerhouses as Alabama, Kentucky, and LSU. James R. Crockett is Professor Emeritus at the University of Southern Mississippi and Adjunct Professor of Accountancy at the University of Mississippi. He is the author of Power, Greed, and Hubris, Judicial Bribery in Mississippi, Hands in the Till, Embezzlement of Public Monies in Mississippi, and Operation Pretense, the FBI's Sting on County Corruption in Mississippi, all published by the University Press of Mississippi. Jim's teaching schedule this semester made him unavailable on Wednesdays, so we have recorded this program in advance. That means we will not be able to take questions from this virtual audience. Welcome, Jim Crockett. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank the Mississippi Department of Archives and History for providing this forum for me to talk about a book that consumed a large part of the last three or four years of my life. <clears throat> It's about Ole Miss and Mississippi State. There's the cover of it. It was scheduled to be published in September. It's already out. Uh, it was supposed to make its debut at the, at the Lawn Party at Mississippi Book Festival, but th that was canceled, but we got it published anyway. So here it is, and let's talk about it. <clears throat> Why this book? Well, three other books that I've written have been published by the University Press. It's already been mentioned. All three of those books about corruption in Mississippi. My wife, Dorothy, who's sitting over here, she suggested that I write something positive about Mississippi. Well, I was looking for something to write positive about Mississippi. My son, Clint <coughs> Crockett, suggested I write my memoirs I told him nobody's interested in the memoirs of an accounting professor and a CPA, and he convinced me that I'd led an interesting life and uh, said you ought to write them. So I started writing them. I was about to finish the memoirs, and it, it dawned on me, uh, and my editor at University Press of Mississippi, Craig Gill, that uh, nobody's going to be interested in those except my family. But while I was doing the research on that, being a a sports fan. In fact, Clint recommended that I wrap my memoirs around what was happening in the Ole Miss sports. And doing the research for that, uh, I ran into a very interesting phenomenon that I don't think anybody else has ever addressed. I haven't found anything about it anyway. And so uh, I found that over this eight-year period, <clears throat> 1959 through 66, Ole Miss and Mississippi State split they, they won half of all the championships available in baseball, basketball, and football. That's 12. They won 12 of 24 ava available championships, which is half of them. That left the other 10 schools in the SEC to share the other, the other half. So this is me, uh, what I did. I spent 20 years at Southern Miss. I graduated from both Ole Miss and Mississippi State, and I spent 20 years at Southern Miss. I was a student in Ole Miss during most of the time period covered in the book, and these were the glory days for both Ole Miss and Mississippi State. There's never been a comparable time before or since. 
And well, I was young then, and we thought those days would never end. <clears throat> but they did, unfortunately. The foreword of the book deals with a racial climate in the SEC at the time. Long story short, uh, SEC was not integrated at the time. And, uh, and so you, you take what happened, and it was all white players, basically. But uh, it was integrated at the time with the help of Mississippi State, which we'll talk about. Uh, it's Ole Miss, Mississippi State got to the point where they would play African American, play against teams that had Afri African Americans. Okay, interesting. Now, I'm an Ole Miss and a Mississippi State fan. Uh, went to both schools, as I said. I try to balance things out. They balanced out automatically in this. Ole Miss won six of the championships, three football and three in baseball. Mississippi State won six, four in basketball and two in baseball. I thought that was kind of interesting. It gives a good balance. The four coaches. <clears throat> Chapter one's about the four co coaches. You know, there's a saying that says it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jimmy's and Joe's that win championships. Coaches are the X's and O's. They draw up the plays. But it actually takes both, as I stress in this, in this thing. Babe, Mar Babe McCarthy, Paul Gregory, Babe McCarthy won four SEC basketball teams. He was coach of the year all four years. Paul Gregory won two baseball championships. He was coach of the year both years. He went on to win two more after this. Tom Swayze won three SEC baseball championships for Ole Miss during the period. Johnny Vaught won three SEC championships in football for Ole Miss. It's kind of interesting. These old men are quite different personalities and style, but they all produced excellent results. All of them are in the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame, which they very well should be. Babe McCarthy. This Babe McCarthy, before the Babe, MSU had never won an SEC basketball championship. During the 10 years he was there, during the 10 years before the Babe arrived, they won only 37% of their games. During McCarthy's 10 years at MSU, they won 67% of the games, including four SEC titles, and he was coach of the year four years, I believe. This is amazing, the next bullet point. Two of McCarthy's championship teams won 24 and won. 24 and won. As I said, he'd been, he was SEC Coach of the Year four times. He led the 1963 team to the NAA, excuse me, NCAA tournament that broke the color barrier, which we'll talk about. A very brave thing he did. <clears throat> Paul Gregory. Gregory won the SEC championships in 65, 66, even though his team did not play a single game in Starkville during those years. They played in Columbus. They were... I tore down the old field in Starkville and built a new one, and for two years they played all their home games in Red Bird Park in Columbus. <clears throat> the overall record was 131.80. He also won SEC championships in 72. That should be 74, I believe. <laughs> he won four championships in all. Two of them was in this, this, this period. He played baseball, basketball, and football at, at Mississippi State. He was a major league pitcher. He was a laid-back coach, really laid-back, but an excellent recruiter. SEC Coach of the Year four times. Now, here's something interesting. Paul Gregory was a basketball coach before Babe McCarthy was hired. He was a terrible basketball coach. <laughs> they didn't win at all. They had they had hired Babe McCarthy. And by the way, Babe McCarthy, before he came to Mississippi State as his coach, he was a junior high school coach. Interesting. But he had coached when he was in the military, and he'd coached high school ball before. Uh, but Paul Gregory was not a good basketball coach, but he was a good baseball coach. Tom Swayze. Look at the bottom point there. He was the South's first football recruiter. And he, helped, he was an assistant football coach and head baseball coach at Ole Miss. He was a great football recruiter, really great. Uh, but when he recruited 
football players. He recruited football players that played baseball, too. <laughs> Most of his team were highly populated with football players that played baseball. Uh, the 1959 1950, champions were prevented from playing in the NCAA because of a racial barrier. Went to the College World Series twice, once during this period and once uh, during this period, excuse me. College World Series in 1964 during this period. Also in 1956 and 69. Um, his overall record was 141-67, 180, 80, 37, 68% of both. The SEC record was 131, 67. That's 68% other games. There's a saying in baseball. Baseball is not like other sports. If you go, if you win 67% of your baseball games, it's like going 11 and 1 in football. They say there are three things in baseball. You're going to win a third of the game if you play any competition that's anywhere close to you. You're going to win a third, lose a third. It's a third in the middle that count. He won a third in the middle all the time. Great, great coach. And as I said, first recruiter. Johnny Ball. Can't say too much about Johnny Ball. Won three SEC football championships during this period, 60, 62, 63, in the 1959 through 66 period. He won three other ones before that, by the way. No coach at Ole Miss has ever won an SEC base, bas, excuse me, football championship except Johnny Ball. He was like Babe McCarthy. When he got to Ole Miss, Ole Miss was terrible. He put him on a map, to say the least. He's one of the greatest coaches ever to coach anywhere. Um, okay, went, went to bowls, won championships. He had three teams that were named national champions by one or more groups. SEC record during an eight-year period was, six, was 66, 16, and 4. Overall record, 190, 61, 12. Went 6 1, excuse me, 6 7 against Barry Bryant. Somebody had to win the tiebreaker, by the way. He went 6 0 against Brawls at Arkansas. Interesting story in the book that I tell. Uh, Coach Brawls uh, never beat Tar never beat Vaughn, and he, at the coaches' meeting, he wouldn't go in the same room that, that uh, Tony Vaughn was in. He was a great coach. Went five three. This is this is an amazing statistic here. Went five three one against LSU from 1959 to 66. Seven of those games were played in Louisiana. Overall, his team played LSU 26 times, and he went 16 seven and three. All but six of those games were played in Louisiana. That, that is absolutely amazing. Those are amazing statistics. He he was. I was a freshman in 1960, so I was there when the 1960, 62, and the 63 teams won the SEC championship. Okay, so I talk about the coaches in the first chapter. Then each chapter I, I take uh, each year, 59 through 66, year by year, and I write about what happened. Uh, there are a lot of numbers in those games there, and I actually highlight a lot of individual games. We're not going to do that here because that's too much to do. I just want to talk about what happened in those years. Chapter 1, The Beginning of Great Things, 1959. It really was the beginning of great things. SEC Basketball Championship with the Mississippi State. They went 24-1. and one. SEC Baseball Champion was Ole Miss. They were great also. SEC football champion was Georgia. Now, Georgia went 7-0 and in the SEC, or 6-0, and and Ole Miss lost one game to LSU. You remember that one, 1959. But Ole Miss was a better team. They, they beat LSU 21 to nothing in the, in the Sugar Bowl and were named national champs after the bowl by several national football champions. Several. They were unbelievable. We'll talk about them. Usually I, on these slides, I just talk about the, the records of, of the um, teams that won championships. In the book itself, I talk about each sport each year. 
how the, how the teams did. I'm not going to do that here, but I did that in, in the book, and I'm featuring here the ones that won championships. Babe McCarthy signed a great Bailey Howell, his first recruiting season in 1955. By 59, the Babe had surrounded Howell with other fine players, including Jerry Graves, Charles Hull, and Jerry Keaton. They went 24 and 1. The only loss was to Auburn. Auburn was a defending SEC championship. They finished third ranked in the national poll. Bailey Howell averaged 28 points per game and 18 rebounds. Consensus All-American. He went on to the pros and played, I think, about 13 years in the, in the pros. Played for seven, uh, several different teams. Won, NAS, won NBA championships with uh, Boston. Uh, when he retired from the pros, he was listed, he was in the top 10 of the nine of the statistical categories they keep track of. He was an unbelievable player, uh, Bailey Howell. Kentucky represented the SEC in an NCAA tournament because Mississippi State schools would not play against African Americans. They didn't get to go. They were 24-1. Tragedy. 1959 SEC baseball champions Ole Miss. Coach Swayze's team, led by All-American Jake Gibbs, finished eight. Uh, 18-6 overall and 12-4 in SEC. This record produced the Rebels' first SEC baseball title ever. Ole Miss won the Western Division and defeated Georgia Tech for the Eastern Division, 2-1 to take a championship. Interesting enough, future Ole Miss Chancellor Robert Kayot had a grand slam home run in the third game to seal, seal the victory over Georgia Tech. By the way, uh, Robert Kayot probably the greatest athlete that ever became a university pressed. <laughs> he played baseball and football, and he was, he was outstanding. Ole Miss was denied the opportunity to represent the SEC in the NCAA playoffs also. That was tragic. Ole Miss football team, one of the best college teams ever to play the game. Fran Tarkenton led Georgia to a 7-0 record, and they were named conference champions, but they, they lost to South Carolina 30-14. to 14. South Carolina was not in the league at the time. <clears throat> they had a 10-1 record overall. I went through all the statistics. They did not compare with Ole Miss in any way. Ole Miss was the best team in the SEC. They, uh, they, went, they lost to, to uh, LSU on the 87-yard Halloween run by Billy Cannon. But they came back and, and just absolutely destroyed LSU and the Sugar Bowl that year. The defense gave up 74 yards in that game. 74. By the way, I, before I forget it, Johnny Ball's team were unbelievable on defense. They went years and years where they were top two or three in the country on defense, not to mention offense. They did two. Pretty well there, too. The 59 Rebels finished 10-1, ranked second nationally in the AP and UPI poll. Syracuse was 11-0 and was named national championship by the polls. Uh, get this. 1959 Ole Miss team scored 350 points and gave up 21 points. Think about that. The opponent's 21 points were scored on Cannon's punt return, a fumble was recovered at the Rebels' third three-yard line. They scored on that. And after a block punt was recovered on the Rebels' seven-yard line, they scored. There was, there was not any extended drive the whole year. Unbelievable. Some of the reasons uh, that team is, is still revered and, and it's often named as one of the top teams ever to play football at the, universe, at the, at the collegiate level. The AP named Ole Miss SEC team of the 1950s decade. The 1959 team has been listed in many top list of top collegiate football players ever, and deservingly so. They were unbelievable. Um, two Rebels, Charlie Flowers and Marvin Terrell, were all Americans. Five were all SEC. Fourteen members of that team have been inducted into the Mississippi State. Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame. You've got to read this about Rick Cleveland, what 
Rick Cleveland wrote about this. Rick Cleveland, famous sports writer in Mississippi, an outstanding sports writer. Years ago, Charlie Flowers was showing me a photo of the 1959 Ole Miss football team. He was pointing out each player, face by face, row by row. There were 43 players. By the way, of those 43 players, about 40 of them were from Mississippi. Uh, uh, 42, Charlie said, graduated. Bank president, CEO of his company, successful lawyer, Charlie said, athletic director, mayor, chancellor, he continued, head football coach, major league baseball player, insurance executive, another mayor. He kept going and going. Finally, he finished, said, there will never be another team like it. Well, I can, you can safely say to this point, there's certainly I've never been on another team like the, like the 59 Rebels. All right, 1960. I'm a freshman at Ole Miss this year. SEC baseball, Basketball Championship, Auburn. <clears throat> baseball, Ole Miss. Football, Ole Miss. By the way, in these eight years, in every one of the eight years, there were at least one championship won by the Mississippi School. In four of the eight years, there were two championships won by by uh, Mississippi School. Nineteen sixty Ole Miss baseball, they had a seventeen game winning streak and they were SEC champions. Coach Swayze's Diamond Re Rebels defended their championship in style, going twenty two and three. Now that's an amazing figure in baseball. The seventeen game streaks include streak included twelve victories over SEC opponents. The streak still stands. The 19, uh, excuse me, the 2016, excuse me, 2000, well, this is 2000, 2020 uh, Ole Miss team had a 16-game winning streak, and then COVID shut them down. They came back the next year, and they won the first game to tie the record. That, that doesn't count. It's got to be in the same, it's got to be the same season. This record still counts here. Uh, the Rebels won the SEC playoffs between Eastern Division champs Florida, two to nothing, two games to nothing. In the first game of the playoff, the Reds stormed back from a 7-0 deficit to win 15 to seven. Amazing. <clears throat> Just like the 59, they didn't get an opportunity to go play in the NCAA tournament because of Mississippi's misguided policies about playing integrated teams. Let me back up here. Now, Jake Gibbs played a wicked third base and led the SEC in batting with 4.24 average and 42 RBI. Excuse me, 4.22 hits, 42 and RBIs, 30. Jake was an amazing player. I got to see him play. Uh, he it was in '61 when I got to see him play, but he did the same thing in in '60. He played third base. He, it wasn't major leagues. He was a catcher. Now, here's why he was, they made him a catcher. Jake, Gee, Jake Gibbs had a great arm. That's the first thing I remember about him because I saw him play. He, he threw that ball anywhere close to third base on the line to first base. Well, the Yankees saw that he, he could do that. They needed a catcher, and they made him a catcher. And that shortened his career. He had seven broken bones or something like that in the, in the pros. He's a great athlete. Larry Williams won seven and lost two. Struck out 80 batters, posted a 1.7 ERA. Named All-American. Tied for the most wins in the SEC with two teammates. He had two, two teammates that won seven games also. Gibbs Williams, Billy Ray Jones, Jamie Howell, Kayot were named first team All-SEC. Bumpkus, Robert Kilpatrick, second All-SEC. And this last line, I think is true. It's doubtful that any other school has placed as many, five, excuse me, has placed five as many or as many players in the All-SEC team, baseball. They were unbelievably good. And let's see, how many of them played base, uh, football? Gibbs, Billy Ray Jones played football. Kayat played football. I'm not sure about the rest of them. 1960 Ole Miss football. This is when I was first there that, that fall. 
It's basically a rerun of the 59 season, except two important aspects. Rather than losing to LSU, the Rebels tied the Tigers 6-6. They played that game at Oxford. <coughs> and that spoiled the, 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 excuse me, because of that tie, they, did, they had an undefeated season, but they didn't have a perfect season because they had a tie. Jake Gibbs had become the starting quarterback in 59 when Bobby Franklin went down with an injury in the second game. Gibbs had a great 1959 season, and in 1960 he became a superstar, leading the Rebs to the SEC championship. All right, on average, Ole Miss averaged 363 yards and gave up 168 yards. The Reb averaged 21 points per game and gave up six. At the end of the regular season, Ole Miss was ranked second nationally by the AP. And they, they, the polls then were done before the bowl games. So they were ranked second nationally in the polls. With an 8-1 record, Minnesota was named national champion. Unfortunately, when Minnesota went to the bowl game, they got whopped by Washington. Uh, but the polls were over. Football Writers of America named the Rebels number one, and they won the Grantland Rice Award. It's number one in the nation. And several other organizations, which named uh, ranked football in those days, named them number one. Rebel stars Jake Gibbs, Bobby Crispino, Jerry Daniels, Alan Green, Bob Benton, Doug Elmore, Chico Taylor, and Robert Price were great. Most of them made all SEC. I was fortunate to be a freshman at Ole Miss at the time. I want to talk about one guy special, Bobby Crispino. Uh, he is an athlete that does not get his due. <laughs> Uh, he's famous, and he, he went on and played pro ball for years, but he was an unbelievable athlete, Bobby Crespina. He was a running back and a receiver, uh, and he dominated in, in, uh, in the bowl games. He went on and played pro ball, but you don't, know, you don't hear too much about Bobby Crespina. He's a huge guy. I remember him very well. <clears throat> 61. Another championship, basketball rising. All right, SEC basketball. Now, Mississippi State won. Bailey Howell graduated in 59. 60, they were, had a down season. They were under 500 a couple of games. 61, though, <laughs> we'll come to that, what caused that. SEC baseball championship, LSU. SEC football, Alabama and LSU tied. All right. As I said here, Bailey Howell was gone, but Babe McCarthy had the best recruiting class in the history of Mississippi State in the fall of 59. You know, they couldn't play as freshmen. They, they only could play three years, starting as junior, on a, excuse me, sophomore on the varsity. Best recruiting class in history. The class included W.D. Red Stroud, Leland Mitchell, Bobby Shiles, and Joe Dan Gold. It would, it would, which would end their career with three SEC championships. I mean, those guys, <laughs> they won every, they're the only team that won every championship that they had the opportunity to win. Great teamwork. They had no superstars in that class, but they had great teamwork. One year they had Jerry, uh, Jerry Graves with them, and then they, Doug Hutton came along to help also when they were juniors. But that team, one, that group of guys won every championship. And very few can say that in any sport in the SEC, that they won every championship that they could. Senator Jerry Graves, who had played in 59, was still around. And he was re really a star as team captain in 61 And another veteran, Jack Brookshire, provides steady and force around which the new sophomores rallied. Uh, the overhaul, the overhaul, overhaul Marines started the season 7-3 against non-conference foe. When SEC opened, they started winning. Went on to post a 19-6 overall record, 11-3 SEC mark. They lost to Kentucky and Florida. And SC, Kentucky 68-62, Florida 59-57, and Ole Miss 74-7 during the season. 
Jay Graves averaged 21 points, 10 rebounds for the champs. Super sophomores averaged 35 points together and 18 rebounds. Again, MSU did not, not get to go to the NCAA tournament because of racial policies. Uh, let me back up. In the book, I talk about the tragedy of Jerry Graves. Some of you might remember. He was Mr. Mississippi State. He was a great person, uh, tremendous athlete. Uh, he got caught up in, a, in the basketball gambling thing. Some gamblers paid him money not to throw games, but to give him some inside information. He would have been drafted high for the NBA and would have had a great NBA career. He never got to play pro ball. He went into um, education and, and finished his career uh, in Kentucky, where he was from. Uh, but he was a great guy, and it was just a tragedy of what happened to him. But he was really productive for Mississippi State. Okay. 1962, this is maybe the best year in Mississippi sports history. There are two others that compare. The, the uh, 59 was a great year. And if Ole Miss had won the SEC championship, it would have been the greatest year uh, in football. But in 62, there was another team that had, maybe it was uh, 63. But anyway, it's 62, maybe the best year in Mississippi sports history. Mississippi State was a, a basketball champion. Florida won a baseball championship. Ole Miss won football. MSU won the Western Division baseball championship with a 25-5 record, but dropped the playoff to Florida. Mississippi State was the best baseball team in the SEC that year. They just lost two games to one to Florida in the playoff. Um, MSU pitcher All-American Frank, Frank Montgomery had a phenomenal season going 10-0, striking out 102 hitters and posting a .81 ERA. Frank Montgomery is a good friend of mine. He is undergoing an operation today for bladder cancer. But he was, he was a senior at Mississippi State before he ever lost a game. Went into pro ball left-handed pitcher and uh, tore up his arm twice, never made it to the majors. Basketball. Super softs are now juniors. And they were joined by another player that's never got his full due, Doug Hutton. 5'10", could jump out of the gym. He could jump up and dunk a basketball over his head left-handed, and he was right-handed. He played baseball, basketball, and ran track at Mississippi State. One of the greatest athletes ever in Mississippi, Doug Hutton. He, he really helped that team. They lost Jerry Graves, and they gained Doug Hutton. And Doug Hutton, he, they ended up having to play a three-guard offense and set a 6 seven guy on the bench for a while because Hutton could rebound like him and, and do a lot more. He's a great player. McCarthy worked his magic with this team, and they simply steamrolled the SEC going 24-1, and 13-1 in the SEC. Matched the 59 team. The only team that beat them was, was Vanderbilt in a, a, all year. Only four teams other than Vandy came within five points of them in that year. Finished the season ranked fourth. An AP poll, but was again denied the opportunity. They were on the SEC. They were denied the opportunity to represent the SEC in the, the tournament. Leland Mitchell, one of the super soft, now super junior, 17 points, 19 rebounds. Red Stroud, 16, 9. Doug Hutton averaged 10 and 3. They averaged 77 points per game and opponent 64. Red Stroud was named the SEC most valuable player and the best and the best playmaker. Jack Berkshire was named the conference's best defensive player. 
1962 MSU Bulldogs dramatically demonstrated what good teamwork will accomplish. They were, they were outstanding. Uh, Red Stride was one of, one of the most fun players ever, ever played uh, of watch in Mississippi. 62. All right. After Jake Gibbs used up his eligibility and signed with the baseball Yankees in 60, Fred Russell of the National Nashville Banner wrote this, a little poem. Alas, when Gibbs joined the Yanks, the conference gave thanks. The, the, the conference thanks rose up to the height of the sun. But we're getting no break, for right behind Jake stands Elmore, Griffin, and Dunn. Those are the three quarterbacks going to be the quarterback the next three years. That's, that, I'll show you what happened. <laughs> okay. So what happened? Football. Doug Elmore. He became the, became the champion, uh, the quarterback. Led him to a, a 9-2 record. 5-1 uh, in SEC. Two losses at LSU, 10-7 which prevented him from winning the SEC. The other loss against Texas in the Cotton Bowl, 12-7. They finished the season against Arkansas in the Sugar Bowl and won the Sugar Bowl, and they ranked fifth in the nation. Doug Elmore is predicted. He kept the, he kept the growing tradition of great Ole Miss quarterbacks alive. Doug Elmore was a great player. I say in the book, there's a picture in the Ole Miss Annual, which you can go and get on the line, that shows Elmore walking off the field with his girlfriend after the loss to LSU. And it'll, it'll, if you're a Rebel fan, it'll make you cry. He was crying. Great, great picture. <clears throat> In 1962, it was Glenn Griffin's turn. And he didn't disappoint. Griffin led Ole Miss to its only perfect season. The Rebels went 10-0 mark, 6-0, reckon the SEC, and a, and a conference championship Scored 247 points, gave up 53. This was accomplished after the ride at Ole Miss, which also almost destroyed the university. Rebel stars, Glenn Griffin, Jim Dunaway, All-Americans, Bob Dixon, Honorable Mention All-American, First Team All-SEC, Woody Dabbs, Chuck Morris, Honorable Mention All-American, Lewis Guy, that should be Allen Brown, all SEC, 913. They were great in 1962 under tremendous adversity. Had to play the homecoming game here in Jackson because of the rod. Okay, this book is about the SEC and Ole Miss and Mississippi State. I spent 20 years on the faculty at Southern Miss, and I've always been a Southern Miss fan. Southern Miss, there's two or three things in this book about Southern Miss. Here's one of them. USM was not an SEC, but its legendary coach Paul Pivan, an Ole Miss alum, led the Southerners to a 9-1 record in the 1962 Collegiate Division National Championship. During the 58th season, Ty had led the Mississippi Southern College to 9-0 record and the same championship. Pivan was almost comparable to to Johnny Vault as a coach. Mississippi, they were Mississippi Southern College in those days. It became a university in 62. But they were great. They also had a great basketball run. What they called them the Golden Giants. I mean, they were really good in basketball during these same year. 63, two out of three again. Basketball champions, Mississippi State. Baseball champions, Auburn. Football, Ole Miss. Basketball. These guys, the super freshmen, super sophs, and super juniors were now seniors. Red Stroud, Leland Mitchell, Joe Dan Gold, and Bobby Shiles led the Rebels to their third consecutive basketball championship. Went 22-6. and six. They snuck off to Michigan to represent the SEC in the NCAA East Regional Tournament and broke the color barrier playing against Loyola of Chicago, which started four African-American players. Loyola won the game 61-51 and went on to win a national championship. Loyola didn't, win, didn't lose but two big games all year. Mississippi State also played Mid-American champion Bowling Green for second place in the regional and defeated the Falcons 
60. Uh, Bowling Green had the great Nate Thurman on there. He got about 30 rebounds. <laughs> He's an unbelievable player. He all pro for many years. MSU seniors finished their career 7 70 and 13 and won three SEC titles. Unbelievable. 63 Ole Miss, kind of a rerun. Now, here's another player that never gotten this due. Perry Lee Dunn was one of the greatest athletes ever to come out of Mississippi. He was the number one recruit in the country when he graduated from Natchez High School in 1960. Uh, he, he became the starting quarterback, another one, uh, following Elmore Griffith. They all followed the Jake, Jake Gibbs. They went 7-1-2. By the way, they would have... They, Two of those games, they tied. One of them was Mississippi State. One of them was Memphis State. Uh, they tied Alabama. Uh, excuse me, the one game they lost was to Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. The tie with Mississippi State was controversial, but Johnny Vaught explained it well. Here's what happened. With about, they were, they were three points behind Mississippi State with about three minutes to go in the game. Ole Miss got to about the three or four yard line. Freddie Roberts, fullback friend of mine, ran the ball and got stopped about behind the line. They had fourth and about two, I think it was. And uh, people criticized Johnny Ball for kicking a field goal for the tie. Uh, because the tie gave him the SEC championship. I've also <laughs> we had just run Freddie Robertson got stopped, so so he kicked a field goal and won it. The Rebels finished the country uh, finished the country ranked seventh nationally in the poll. All right, <clears throat> 64 baseball championship and freedom to play in the College World Series. After Mississippi State snuck off to play in Michigan in the, in the NCAA tournament. That, it, was, it was no law against playing integration, in an integrated team. There was a gentleman's agreement, supposedly, between the legislature and the people of the IHL that they would not play integrated teams. Well, Mississippi State, they, actually there was a, a restraining order that was supposed to be served on them the day they flew out, snuck out in the morning and went and played. Anyway, they, they broke it. Uh, 1964 baseball championship, Ole Miss, basketball, Kentucky, Alabama, and football. Coach Swayze's 54 team was simply loaded with talent. It finished the regular season 19-4, 11-1 in the SEC. Had the great Donnie Kester, a shortstop. By the way, y'all see... Johnny Kessner still winning awards. He just got put in the Cubs Hall of Fame. He's a great player. He, Donny, I played against him in, in uh, flag football at Ole Miss. <laughs> he, played, he was an All-American in baseball and basketball. Jake Gibbs was at baseball and football. I played against him in, you know, what do you call it, rec league uh, football. You couldn't touch him. He's the greatest athlete I've ever seen. He just, Anyway, they led by All-American Donny Kessner and these other guys. They were just super. It should say 1964 at the top, but it doesn't. They won the SEC Western Division and defeated East Division winner Auburn two games to one. They swept the NCAA District 3 playoff 3-0 in a double elimination format. <clears throat> Since the color barrier was gone, they represented the SEC in a, in a tournament. In a, in a college world series. They lost Southern Cal 3-2 and Arizona State 5 -0. One of the worst things that ever happened to Mississippi sport happened right here in this in the College World Series. I explained it in the book. What happened, the loss to Southern California was outrageous. Simply put, the NCAA decided to go against its own rule that was in place at the beginning of the game. 
rather than postponing the game when, when it, it was stopped in the fifth inning, South Cal, excuse me, Southern Cal up 3-1, they suspended it. And after it was resumed, Southern Cal wound up winning 3-2. They were supposed to start over. There was no provision for suspending a game under the NCAA rules in that time. You had to start over just like nothing happened, but they just want to run against their own thing. SEC 1965 baseball, MSU climbs the mountain. Uh, Mississippi State had had good teams for several years, but they could never go over to the top and win the SEC until 1965. So they were 65, they were baseball champions of the SEC. Vanderbilt won basketball and Alabama football. <clears throat> Mississippi State baseball. <laughs> they had, as I said, they had team, good teams for quite a while, but now they won it. They went 11 4 in the conference, won the Western Division, and beat Auburn in the playoff. The racial barrier allowed them to proceed to the NCAA tournament. They lost out in the tournament. But they were an outstanding team, that 65 baseball team. They defeated Florida State 6 1 in the first game of the district playoff with pitcher Ken Tatum pitching and hitting and Charlie Smith who graduated from Jackson Central a year after I did in a second game against Furman. Frank Chambers who graduated a year after that from Jackson Central, he had a sore arm but he had to start pitch. They, he went eight innings, gave up five hits and six walks and they lost five to two. Now in the losers brackets, they played the Paladins again and lost six two, and did not advance to the College World Series. Several real stars, several uh, Major League Baseball connection. Coach Gregory had pitched in the majors. His son Paul was a pitcher on the team. Claude Paso Jr.'s dad, Claude, was on the team. Pitched 15 years in the major. Bobby Bragan Jr., dad played in the major leagues and managed the Atlanta Braves and Dale Unser and pitcher Ken Tatum went on to play in the major leagues and have outstanding careers, both of them. Ken Tatum is another one that never got his due. He was a great player. I mean, a great player. Mississippi State would have had two less SEC championships in baseball without him. <clears throat> Again, they played all their home games in Redbird Field in Columbus kind of interesting. They drew well in Columbus. They drew well, they drew better than anybody else in the SEC in Columbus, I think. <clears throat> in this writer's opinion, had Doug Hutton played for the Dogs, they would have advanced to the College World Series. Here's what happened. I told you Doug was a three-sport man. Uh, he set out his senior year in, uh, in baseball, planning to come back, take that as a redshirt year, and come back and play the next year Baseball, work on his master's degree. But, as so happens, he, he got married. <laughs> he, he and his future wife decided they would get married. He had to have a job. So he got married and went coaching. If he had played, he was a great athlete, great pitcher. If he had played, I'm convinced they would have gone to the College World Series. Okay, 1966, <clears throat> end of an era. Again, Mississippi State won baseball championship, Kentucky basketball, and Alabama football. 66 was kind of a rerun of 20, uh, 65. They finished the season 17-9, 11-4 in the conference. They played the Eastern Division champ in Tennessee for the SEC playoff and dispatched them 2 to nothing. Advancing to District 3 playoff, now they're free to go. Uh, they lost to North Carolina in the second game and to FSU in the third game. Coach Paul Gregory was named Coach of the Year for the second straight year. Again, the, the games were played in Redbird Field in Columbus. That ends the championships, and uh, there have since then, there's been no SEC championship in football. I think Mississippi State has won one overall championship in basketball, and they won uh, 
two or three uh, basketball tournament championships. Ole Miss has won a couple of tournament basketball uh, championships. And they've won some baseball championships since then. But there's never been a period like this before or after. Now, I did a little research and said, anybody else in the SEC ever had a period like this? Well, I found out in the 70s, Alabama won seven SEC championships in football and two in basketball. That's nine. And uh, maybe... And uh, Auburn won three in baseball or something. They, there was a period that some of the other teams did, but it wasn't distributed evenly like, uh, like Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Ten, I say Ken Tatum should have been an All-American, a 10-2 record. Dale Lonser was an All-American, All-SEC. Don Bell was All-SEC. Okay, that's the 10 years quickly. I honored the, the coaches at the beginning. At the end, I honored the Jimmys and Joes. And that was hard to do. As I say, it's, some say it's, X, it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jimmys and Joes. It's not coaching, it's, it's the players. And it's only a half truth, it takes both. We honored, honored the coaches. Now, I, I was going to honor some of the some of the players, but there's so many of them that were so good, so many of them. I mean, we got outstanding athletes playing all three of those sports. I couldn't, I couldn't pick just five or six of them, so I decided to pick one player from each store, sport who was really great and, uh, and talk about him and uh, to honor all the players of that sport. So that's what I did in this chapter. I took Bailey Howell for basketball, and the only person that was even close to Bailey Howell in basketball that I could have chosen was Don Kessinger, and Bailey Howell was even better than Don Kessinger. He was an obvious choice. Baseball, Don Kessinger, All-American, six-time Major League All-Star. Football, Jake Gibbs. Both Don Kessinger and Jake Gibbs were All-American in two sports. So I write brief biographies of them in this chapter. Now, then I decided, uh, I was looking for individual players. I say even outstanding coaches and, independent and individual players do not win championships. It takes great teamwork. I attempted to select an individual team that I thought best represented teamwork. I couldn't do that. It takes every one of them good teamwork. Every one of them. So I chose to honor the three, uh, the Mississippi State basketball class that won all three of the championships available. So I wrote briefly about uh, Red Stroud, Leland Mitchell, Joe Dan Gold, and Bobby Shouse. Uh, Matt White was on that recruiting class, but he dropped out before he was a senior. They were great, and it was absolutely teamwork. They did not have a superstar. Okay, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'll take questions. If anybody would like to, or comments, if anybody would like to make. Go ahead. Uh, I noticed when you said the coaches' names, a lot of the uh, coaches' names are honored in the different athletic fields on both campuses. I was wondering if you could highlight, you know, the Swayze Field. And so, oh, yes. Uh, it's in there. It's in the book. Baseball field at Ole Miss is named for Swayze. Bought Hemingway Stadium. It's named for ball. Uh, I guess those are the only ones. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? That was very, very good, Professor. And I date back. That's my era. <laughs> that I date back to. I was in graduate school at Mississippi State. 58-59, so I got to see Bailey Howell play, and as you've described him, he was the consummate basketball player, sound fundamentals, and six feet seven, but yet dominating rebounds, perfect form, and blocking out, and a great team player. And I have uh, I mentioned to uh, 
some of the young people here at Archives and History uh, that uh, Babe McCarthy really, uh, as you noted, just revolutionized basketball at Mississippi State and therefore in the conference and of course the state of Mississippi as well. But I remind them that prior to his coming to Mississippi State, the dominant basketball teams in Mississippi were Delta State <laughs> and Mississippi Southern College. That's right. That's right. You're exactly right. And uh, when I was at Delta State, Coach Ricks would uh, schedule a preseason practice game against Ole Miss. I reckon Coach Gregory was smart, smart enough not to do that. <laughs> but uh, Coach Bonnie Graham at Ole Miss played the game under two conditions. One was that it had to be played at Cleveland in the, old, the Whitfield Gymnasium. And number two was that the gymnasium had to be locked <laughs> and, and nobody could come see the game. So we would wait anxiously to the next morning to see the basketball boys and see how it came out. And Dell State would beat them something like 90 to 69. And that was, I think, during the Joe Gibbon era at, uh, oh, at Ole, Ole Miss. Oh, Joe Gibbon was second to Wilt Chamberlain in scoring his senior year. That's right. But uh, that is a good presentation you have, and I look forward to to reading your, your book here. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Somebody should write a book about Delta State sports. Yeah. Delta State has had great sports. Uh, uh, it's in the top in the nation as, as far as college sports for years. Mm -hmm. And Steve Campbell uh, coached them when they won the national championship about 10 years ago or 12 years ago in football in their, their division. He and my number one son are best friends. A great guy. And then one other thing about Babe McCarthy, uh, I'm sure there may have been other coaches who did it, but uh, he particularly with that last group, that Stroud and Mitchell mm -hmm. group, Dan Go, he developed that, what do you call it, the four-corner offense, no shot clock, before Dean Smith was ever coaching and worked it to perfection and would aggravate Coach Rupp to just the nth degree. Uh, Babe had a philosophy that they can't score if they don't have the ball. <laughs> but he also had a speed-up game, too. He, uh, we had four outstanding coaches, but they're two super great coaches, Johnny Vaughn and Babe McCarthy. Both of them started from scratch, I mean. And, you know, when, I, when Bear Bryant went to Alabama, Alabama already had a great tradition in football. And they had everything in place. That wasn't true with uh, Johnny Vaught at Ole Miss. Same thing in uh, basketball. Mississippi State had no tradition in basketball. They, those are two absolutely great coaches. And then I have to remind my Ole Miss friends that they're very fortunate because uh, Coach Vaught came, his first year was 47, I believe. Good, good, great season, good season 47, good season in 48, and then it kind of leveled off on him. And 49 was rough, and folks began to talk about we've hired the wrong coach. <laughs> and he didn't really break out of that until, what, 52? 52. 52, yeah. uh, But he, I say in the book, uh, who is the guy that hired him, the athletic director. Ted Smith hired him. They hired him on a handshake agreement. I say the few, if any, hires in sports, coll collegiate sports, compare with that hire. <laughs> that, was, that was an absolutely great hire. Uh, you mentioned uh, can't score if they don't have the ball. You list some of the sayings that Babe McCarthy had in the book, 
uh, now it's cloud up and rain all over them. Could you say a few words about the personalities and coaching styles maybe of, of Vaught and, and uh, McCarthy, if nobody else? Okay. Vaught, Vaught never raised his voice. He was the original quarterback whisperer. He was with the quarterback all during the week. They would, the quarterback helped do the game plan. He didn't have to tell him anything. On the quarterback called his own plays. Uh, and uh, Jim, what's his name, the, the singer, Jim Weatherly, you know, he played quarterback after, uh, uh, after the next year after this. So he writes in his book, Night Train, that, uh, that Coach Vault never raised his voice. I concluded, he had great assistant coaches that did, and he kept his coaching staff together the whole time. Uh, but he did, he did, I say in the book that he didn't raise his voice. He didn't have to. They had so much respect for him. You can hear right now, Archie Manning or some of those guys talk about Coach Paul. I mean, he's like a god to them. They didn't, they didn't have to scream him. Dave McCarthy was a funny guy. He would say funny things. Doug Hutton told me several things like I, I put in the book. <clears throat> We're going to cloud up and rain all over him. Doug was afraid to take shots. And uh, Coach McCarthy ta told them all they had to take a vaccination or some type, some type of shot. And Doug didn't do it. <clears throat> so so ca Coach McCarthy caught him one day and said, Boy, do you, uh, you want to play basketball this year? <laughs> He said, yes, well, get a shot. Anyway, and there's several other things about Babe McCarthy. Uh, he was kind of a country boy, but he was really smart. By the way, at the collegiate level back then, <clears throat> it's, it's even more true today, that you have to be smart to be a coach. You had no dumb coaches <laughs> that, are, that are successful, let's put it that way. McCarthy, he could recruit. Uh, people loved him. Uh, tragedy about him not staying there at Mississippi State. I didn't get into that in the book, but the tragedy that he didn't. Uh, Paul Gregory is very interesting. As I said, he was a terrible basketball coach. <clears throat> he is a very laid-back baseball coach. <clears throat> his, his practices were informal. He said, who wants to pitch back practice today? Uh, tell me when you're ready to start, pitchers. Uh, you know, it's very, very laid back. He did very little detailed coaching. And I finally figured it out, and I asked Doug Hutton if I was right, and he said yes, and I, and I asked Frank Montgomery if I was right. But what he did, <clears throat> he recruited outstanding uh, uh, baseball players, a lot of them from right here in the Jackson area. Though. In the Jackson area we had it in those days, I went to Jackson Central, and Cooter Berry was the coach there. Uh, his great baseball coach had a great baseball coach at Murrah and one at uh, um, Clinton also. Anyway, he recruited baseball players, a lot of them from Jackson. They were fundamentally sound before they ever got to him. Yeah. <laughs> and he let them do their thing. That's the way he won. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I think we have come to the top of another hour. Although, I, let me ask one, one other quick question. I thought it was really interesting um, in your book how you note how many of those star players came back and became coaches <clears throat> in Mississippi afterwards as well. Yeah, uh, Donnie Kessinger coached Ole Miss baseball for a while. So did Jake Gibbs. Uh, of course, uh, I didn't mention him on my, my talk, uh, but Billy Brewer, right. same way. Uh, at, uh, Jordan Gold coached Mississippi State. He also coached in high school for years. And uh, <clears throat> Bobby, uh, what's his name? And anyway, one of the big four. Uh, he, he coached for a while also. Yeah. They, they, they loved sports and they were coached by good coaches. Yeah, yeah. Game. I mean, from early on, right. playing in multiple sports, right. going off, having careers, and then coming back and, and continuing. Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I use Jake Gibbs. Don Kessner and Bailey Howell to represent everybody. Yeah. Those were three, not only great players, but great human beings. Every one of them. Fine, fine men. Lifetime. That's a nice note to end on. Thank you all for 
joining us today virtually. Uh, remember to tune in next week for Joshua Rothman. Um, and thank you, Jim Crockett, for this great look into Mississippi sports. The book is available at better bookstores across the state. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>